Thank you everyone for the time to join us today. We have a, an exciting session planned. Um, to get underway, I just wanted to make a couple of notes about today's webinar session. We will be recording a webinar and that will be made available after today's session. As a result, we're going to be muting all of the lines. This will help with the quality of the recording, um, keeping the background noise to a minimum. So you're, you will be muted. If you have any questions, please use the chat window at the bottom right-hand portion of your WebEx screen. We will be taking some questions at the end of the session. Uh, if you have questions throughout, please enter them into the, the chat window uh, and we'll take note of that and try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the session. Uh, we are expecting uh, probably a little more than 30 minutes say probably closer actually to 40 minutes um, with, with about 10 minutes of questions. And, and just a reminder, uh, divisionics.com slash webinars, uh, please visit this site and, and uh, continue to join us for these sessions on an ongoing basis. I would like to introduce our guest speaker. This is Professor Brent French. From, he's a professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. Uh, and Dr. will be speaking to us today about cardiography with the Vivo 2100 applications in mouse models of myocardial infarction and LD remodeling. Um, Dr. Fred is a longtime uh, friend and user of Visual Sonics technology, and it's really a pleasure to have him join us today uh, online uh, from Charlottesville. So at this point, I'd, we're going to just pass the uh, presenting rights over to Dr. French, <laughs> and we'll get underway. Dr. French, are you there? I am. Thank you, Andrew, and I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. It's uh, not often we get uh, to reach such a, a wide audience and such a specialized topic. So uh, without further ado, ado, I'll get started um, with uh, applications and mouse models of myocardial infarction and LV remodeling. As most of you must know already, mouse models of infarction are valuable for looking at gene function and transgenic and knockout mouse, mice and, and other genetically manipulated mice as well as I'll show today, uh, and also touch upon the testing of new therapies for myocardial infarction and LV remodeling. Um, furthermore, the mouse model is useful for developing new diagnostic indices of heart disease, and I hope to show a few examples of that as well. On the other hand, we all appreciate that uh, performing imaging in mice is quite challenging. It's, uh, it can be difficult to quantify subtle functional differences in mice due to the small heart size and the rapid heart rate. So uh, the example I'll uh, cover today is a study in which we evaluated the efficacy of ECSOD gene therapy in a mouse model of post-MI LV remodeling. And of course, ECSOD is the extracellular isoform of the uh, superoxide dismutase enzyme. So of introduction, uh, again with this audience, I'm sure you're quite familiar with the uh, with the progression of LV remodeling as a result of myocardial infarction. Here we've got a diagram from uh, a review paper in which we depict the the infarct zone. Let's see if I can get my my little pointer working here. We depict infarct zone. We have acute compensation, and one thing that's not really appreciated but is has become uh, evident from with the advent of cardiac MRI and late gallium enhanced imaging is that the cut point between stabilization and LV remodeling, at least in humans treated with ACE inhibition and beta blockade, is about 24% of LV mass. So your infarct is less than 24% of LV mass, you're likely to stabilize, whereas if your infarct is much larger, the additional wall stress that is imposed upon the rest of the heart, particularly the LV chamber, 
is predisposing you to LV remodeling and ultimately failure. So it's it's this it's this balance that uh, we're looking at in in the study with the hypothesis that we can we can move that balance point with gene therapy. So. Uh, by way of introduction with regard to the uh, gene therapy vector, this is uh, adeno-associated virus. I won't go into a great deal of detail um, since our, our focus really here is on ultrasound and not gene therapy, but uh, there are some key advantages to adeno-associated uh, uh, viruses as a, as a vector system that we've, uh, that we've listed here. And uh, the thing that I'd like to point out in particular is the serotype of AAV that we're using, the AAV9 acid, which is already cardiotropic, but which means it, it uh, has preference for infecting cardiomyocytes naturally, uh, actually muscle tissue in general. But this can be made even more specific by utilizing a cardiac-specific promoter. So uh, this is bioluminescence imaging shown at the right, where we have the CMV promoter, dry luciferase. And so in essence, this mouse from, from head to tail is glowing like a firefly after luciferin injection. Where with a cardiac specific promoter and a single intravenous injection of a reasonably small dose, we can get cardiac specific gene expression. And if we switch reporters to GFP, we can prove to you that at reasonable doses, we're not just hitting every cardiomyocyte in the LV, we're hitting the cardiomyocytes multiple times over. So these X-right cells represent cells which are expressing 5 to 10 copies of, of GFP. So this is a pretty powerful system to use test bed for, um, for various, uh, testing various uh, gene therapies uh, against LV remodeling. And so the hypotheses here were first that uh, we could inhibit LV remodeling with cardiac-specific expression of ECSOD, and that secondly, higher resolution echo could provide sensitive measures of the effects of gene therapy on LV form and function after MI. Um, a few words about the experimental design. Uh, these were male C57 black six mice, aged uh, 10 to 12 weeks at the beginning of the study. We used a jugular vein injection under anesthesia to make sure that we got all of the viral vector in. Uh, some tail vein injections are a little less reliable. We used one ounce 10 to the 11th vector particles per mouse, and we administered them 10 minutes after reperfusion. In this study, since it is an LV remodeling study, study, we used an extended coronary occlusion, that is 60 minutes, and that's purposefully to get a large and reproducible myocardial infarct. Um, we typically look for infarcts that, are, that involve 30 to 50 percent of L mass, so that we're well above that 24 percent cut point. So then we applied uh, the Vivo uh, 2100 to do high res echo at the following time points after uh, reperfusion, that is 3, 7, 14, 21, 28 days. And of course, most of you are quite familiar with the Vivo 2100. Uh, in particular, we're, we're showing here the, uh, the mobilized uh, mount for the transducer and the platform along with a, a micro manipulator by which you can step that platform as well. We've got a uh, rendition of it here stylistically of the mobilized transducer, skinning the heart, and in this study 
we took to 12 parallel short axis slices and we we uh, stepped them at 0.5 millimeter intervals and so this is uh, high high to the imaging and we are we're using this in a very MR uh, type of analysis we're taking a dense short axis stack and doing image analysis on every slice. And we've we've done that in essence because we've we've invested so much in the mice at this point in time that it only makes sense to to spend an equal amount of effort on the analysis. So uh, by Simpson's disk volume summation, we can figure out our LD volumes as well as our uh, the volume of the muscle mass. All right, and we we also made use of the Vivo strain package on the 2100, and that's that's uh, shown here, where we've uh, where at left you've got a normal synchronized wall motion from a a standard mouse, and at uh, right we've we're reminding you of the different strain measurements that that can be made in longitudinal strain, in blue circumferential strain, and in green real strain. Let's see if we can get some of these cines running now. So at baseline, we are uh, showing. Uh, a normal mass here and normal contractile function. This is a long axis image, of course. Day three, it's after MI, it's easy to appreciate the infarct in the anterior wall. Day seven, notice that uh, chamber volume has increased substantially, the wall has dilated in the infarct zone. And by day 18, we've shown in as we've shown in previous studies, uh, this is essentially essentially nearing the end of LV remodeling. So you've got as about as much chamber volume uh, as you're as you're going to get, and and one would uh, one would not have any trouble distinguishing between this art at day 14 and. and and the normal one at, at baseline. So let's hear a few controls and ECSOD treated. Uh, this is at the end of the study, day 28. You'll notice substantial LV remodeling. Uh, we've, we've assumed a uh, 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 round geometry as opposed to an oval, and that's uh, quite a bit improved with with the ECSOD treatment. So again, using the the disk summation method, we can very accurately determine the LV volumes both at end diastole and at systole. Interestingly, there is not a lot of difference between groups up to day seven, and that difference only becomes apparent at day fourteen and is maintained until day 28, both in the end diastolic volume and in the end systolic volume. So if these changes are proportional, then there's really nothing to be seen from ejection fraction. And I think this is an important point, that if one just uh, stops the analysis at ejection fraction, they may miss quite a bit. Of course, you need both in systolic and diastolic volumes to get the ejection fraction, but it it shows the importance and, and actually why we favor, as a single endpoint, we would favor in systolic volume over any other volume when it comes to LV uh, remodeling studies or any other global metric, I should say. Let's turn now to even a higher level of analysis, which is in the speckle tr tracking, and we'll look at uh, uh, the speckle tracking uh, output of vivo strain in a normal mouse here. And if we look at longitudinal strain, 
we'll see that in each of the segments it's highly homogeneous and uh, behaving like a normal mouse should. Look uh, at day 28 after MI in control mice. And again, we've got a basketball-shaped heart. We've got very little uh, washing in the infarct zone. And basically, this mouse is, uh, is living off of its uh, basal aspect of the heart. For that to the ECSOD, and you'll see that the, the extent of, of the deficit, wall motion deficit, is, is much smaller and that uh, we're getting better, uh, better strain generation uh, throughout uh, the posterior wall. So we can sector this up and look at uh, individual sectors by longitudinal strain. As, as you notice here, uh, we've only really got one segment which is behaving normally, and the, the rest of the segments are uh, severely uh, defective. Um, ECSOD case, we've got more segments that are contributing to longitudinal strain. So we then uh, put numbers on all that, and, and each of the mice in the group, which uh, ranged from eight, eight, and eight or nine mice per group, we find that we really only have a difference statistical <clears throat> significance in longitudinal strain in the basal inferior segment and in the basal anterior segment. So most of the improvement is actually manifest in the basal aspect of the heart. But that improvement is good enough to give an overall significant improvement in global longitudinal strain. So why do we why did we focus on longitudinal strain for the study? Uh, the, the short answer is we were, we were trying to finish up the study before uh, the AHA abstract became due. And uh, longitudinal strain is, is from a long axis image, gives one probably the best assessment of the overall extent of injury, certainly better than any single short axis plane, because any single short axis plane will not give you uh, as, as good an overview as a, a long axis will. But also regional LV geometry and the radius of curvature, which is larger in the longitudinal direction, at least in the ECSOD treated mice. And so the, the longitudinal strain may, may actually be a more sensitive measure of cardiac dysfunction, at least in this study. So with regard to this study, cardiac specific expression of ECSOD attenuates LV remodeling. The uh, serial studies of LV remodeling are expedited using high-res echo and uh, speckle tracking with the uh, vivo strain on the 2100 provides the spatial and temporal resolution necessary to detect subtle differences in regional cardiac function, which are not as evident from global mesh such as EF. Remember, in EF we saw essentially no difference between groups. So we're now to the subject of non-invasively measuring infarct size in, in mice. And in this, uh, in this study, we've got the advantage of having a high-field MRI scanner available to us. And many years of experience in using uh, late gadolinium enhanced imaging to accurately measure infarct size in mice, and we published that back in 2004, uh, we, we showed that um, infarct size is determined by gadolinium enhancement by cardiac MRI is very tightly correlated with infarct size as uh, defined by the standard histological assessment by TTC. So, um, for years, uh, many years, uh, cardiologists have been eyeballing 
uh, the premature absence of infarct in patients using echo, just looking for um, wall motion deficits. And, and so it, it makes sense intuitively that one should be able to use radial strain as a measurement of infarct size. And if we uh, code these, these uh, high-density uh, stacks of, of uh, short axis images for uh, cardiac function, uh, radial strain by the uh, uh, VO2100 versus late gallium enhancement by MRI, you can see that uh, there is a spatial uh, spatial correlation. So we we wanted to try and put a number on this and make this a little bit more quantitative. Again, we we do have the advantage of having state of the art instrumentation, both with regard to the Vivo 2100 and with regard to high field MRI. And the seven Tesla Clin scan, which is uh, a represents a collaboration between Brooker and Siemens. Um, it's not, not everyone has uh, these resources available to them, and, and so um, what, we, what we're hoping to do is to make, uh, make the advantages of high-field MRI to, to transpose them, so to speak, onto output from the 2100. So in this, again, we're looking at a 60-minute for inclusion in B6 mice, we're using the 2100 with the MS400 transducer. Again, high density short axis stacks, and uh, comparing that against late gadolinium enhanced imaging using inversion recovery to detect the T1 shortening by the gadolinium contrast agent, and again, using that same short axis stack. Uh, taken at 0.5 millimeter increments. Here are a few examples. We have uh, indicated the uh, infarct uh, is detected by the gadolinium is brighter too, and one can see that quite uh, evident on the top row. On the second row, we have a map of radial strain is determined um, with the 2100, and you can see that radial strain, of course, uh, is better in red in the viable tissue, and there's little or no strain in the infarct regions. So what we did then was to apply a receiver operator char characteristic analysis, an ROC analysis, to the data, and, and basically what we're trying to do here is to determine the fish hole at which the radial strain detects the presence of infarction. And so basically we are we tested various thresholds and got the best area under the curve here at a radial strain threshold of 16%. So here's the curve, fairly good on the true positives and true negatives. Uh, the sensitivity, 0.86, specificity, pretty hard to beat, 0.94. If we look at infarct size, using this 16% threshold, if we look at infarct size by ultrasound, compare it to MRI, that's not a bad correlation, R squared of 0.01, and the bland Altman is pretty level two. So this is a reasonable way to go about detecting or measuring infarct size in mice, and uh, we've, we've got a, a few uh, uh, these to illustrate that. So we've got a, a spinning heart showing you the area that's enhanced by late gadolinium. And remember, this is really an apples to oranges comparison. The late gadolinium is essentially measuring the same thing as TTC staining. Whereas radial strain, of course, is measuring just that, and see that uh, the area, area that's afflicted in the uh, anterior apex of the heart is very similar between the two. If we take and we uh, we make projections out of those um, out of those stacks 
and flatten it out like a world map, you can see that the locations of Africa are pretty similar between the two. And, um, and of course, that threshold of 17, uh, excuse me, 16 percent uh, rate strain is what enabled us to generate that that uh, map. So let's, I think we've got a couple of more, a couple of uh, additional uh, strain centers to show you here in a null mouse. Uh, this is using an analysis, uh, the post hoc analysis, to see uh, generation uh, throughout the wall, throughout the cardiac cycle. And here, 28 days post MI, I wanted uh, to show this particular CINE because it illustrates the uh, cardiac dyssynchrony that can develop late after MI. Notice that there's almost a peristaltic wave uh, that's of, of strain generation in uh, the posterior wall, and that that, uh, that actually the action is headed in the wrong direction. So that's not uh, not very good for cardiac output. So the final topic I'd like to touch upon today is measuring LV dyssynchrony with the VO 2100, and in this uh, study, we've uh, used 11 control mice, and we've used uh, nine INOS knockout mice. And the study design is, uh, the time is depicted at the top, where we've got baseline imaging. We've got ischemia reperfusion injury at day zero, and then imaging at day two, day four, day seven, day 14, and day 28. And this, I guess, is the um, is our preferred timeline for catching as much as we can out of the progression of LV remodeling. And I'll show you in a moment the utility of the day two and the day four measurements. So let's look at insystolic um, and diastolic volumes over time after MI in normal and uh, INOS knockout mice. Now, our lab and others have previously shown that, that uh, remodeling is much reduced in INOS knockout mice. So, so that's already been shown. But we, in this study, we wanted to use the Vivo 2100 to, to try and more accurately assess what was actually happening in the heart with a higher um, high number of time points and at higher temporal resolution at each one of those time points. So you'll notice that when it comes to uh, either end diastolic or systolic volume, there's not a lot of difference between groups up to day four, but then we get divergence at day seven. In fact, we get statistical difference from day seven on to the end of the study. And remember I said that in most cases, you'll get most of your LV remodeling complete by day 14. The utility of day 28 is to prove that the, uh, the effect is durable. And for instance, in the INOS knockout mice here, shown in red, they, they maintained that advantage out to day 28. It, it was not a transient improvement. So these differences were big enough that, yes, we did wind up with uh, statistical differences in ejection fraction in this case. So we've got, we reached the significance at 14. It was maintained at day 28. But re what we really wanted to talk about here was uh, cardiac dyssynchrony. And so one form of cardiac dyssynchrony is the dyskinesia or paradoxical wall thinning that occurs early after myocardial infarction during the process of infarct wound healing. And so we, in pilot studies, we uh, determined where that, uh, where that was maximal. And uh, it's, it's somewhere between uh, two and three days post MI. And we've, we've also, in this article here, published in UMB in, in last year, we've uh, 
um, characterize a new metric for measuring that LV dyskinesia. We call it the contraction index. And I may be running out of time to to uh, get into the details of how it's calculated, but basically it's using equations very similar to those used in AC power output. It's measuring efficiency. And so, for instance, if we look at three segments, let's, let's imagine a single short axis uh, slice, and we, we measure displacement in each of three segments rather than six, simply for, for the case of simplification. And we'll see in a normal mouse that we get pretty good displacement no matter where we look. If we then add up the sum of those displacements, we get the curve in green. And that will find um, in a normal mouse, and that area under that curve we'll call the contraction index. Let's imagine that we've got a post in mouse that's even got some paradoxical wall thinning, some dyskinesia in the infarct zone. Well, in that mouse, we'll actually, um, if we take the unsigned sum, we will get um, a, a different value than the, sum, the signed sum. So if we take absolute values, as, as we mean, uh, by unsigned sum. If we take absolute values, we get uh, a, a bigger very under the curve than if we take the unsigned sum. And so that's what gives rise to the weighting of the contraction index. It's, it's specifically weighted in order to be sensitive to dyskinesia. And in that paper, we, we compared this new against a variety of existing metrics, and you can see that the contraction index in green is quite sensitive to the dysfunction that occurs uh, shortly after MI, uh, days, days two to three uh, post-MI. I notice that it's not very sensitive to the dyssynchrony that occurs later. Other metrics, such as standard deviation to time to peak strain, are actually preferred for measuring the form of the dyssynchrony that uh, forms in the viable myocardium layer after MI. Let's turn back. Let's let's apply that metric now in this particular study. Let's apply the contraction index and look at LV dyskinesia focusing particularly on day four. Now, two, we would recommend picking up that time point because um, it's an excellent place to apply this threshold of 16% radial strain in order to determine infarct size and to demonstrate that your infarct size is similar between groups. Uh, it's preferable to day one because the mice are fairly unstable at day one, and they are the respiration is much improved on day two, if not the CG. So we've transitioned from from our first scan after MI being at day one to using day two. The reason why we uh, like day four is because it's particularly sensitive here to the uh, uh, dyskinesia, LV dyskinesia, and you'll notice with the contraction index on the right, we've got a statistical uh, difference at day four in the contraction index. And it is at a point where there's essentially no difference in the LV volumes. Those differences don't show up until day seven or later. And some can argue here that the contraction index can predict subsequent LV remodeling. Let's turn now to the form of dyssynchrony that develops in the viable myocardium later after MI. And um, we've previously used uh, or preferred standard deviation of time to peak real strain for that measurement. But here we've uh, applied a new method which is related to uh, Ruhr, 
to rail uniformity ratio estimate. And that's because we're, we're, we're all using a Fourier transform, but the input data into that Fourier transform is radial displacement instead of radial strain. So this uh, simplifies the analysis a little bit, uh, saves a step, and we think gives uh, uh, gives results that are comparable, perhaps even better. Well, we we uh, still have to figure that out. But note again that we are with this metric, we're detecting a difference between groups at day four, and that uh, is maintained out through the end of the study. This would be a potentially useful metric for for long-term dyssynchrony. So um, I that it uh, would be good here to finish up to acknowledge my many contributors for for these studies, um, primarily John Hossack, Fred Epstein. Uh, we've got some postdocs in the lab, as well as graduate students that uh, contributed to the study, and we've also got uh, grant support from the NIH and from the HA. So I think we'll uh, turn it back now to Andrew to uh, field some questions. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. French. That was uh, fantastic. And we, we do have some questions coming in. So um, I'm going to start it. Uh, one here from from member audience. Um, I guess you do you have any suggestions for performing echo on post MI mice when maneuvering around things like sutures, tissue adhesion, etc.? So that's, that's an excellent question, and um, our preferred method is to uh, actually uh, change the surgery a little bit, tra change the access point, so that you avoid the region of the chest that you're ultimately going to want to perform echo on. So we, we've taken to moving our incision uh, down to the side to the extent possible that we can still access the anterior wall while uh, minimum impact on the area that is uh, where you're going to apply the transducer. Um, there, there are also post processing approaches that Dr. Hasek is developing, and these involve principal component analysis to essentially denoise the images and try and re-extract the, the data that, that is being uh, essentially shadowed by those artifacts. And so uh, he has a triple E paper. If you look, um, look for Dr. John A. Hasek, and uh, and I believe you can find his description of that approach to uh, post-processing uh, sure. and and getting the the maximum uh, you can out of your images. Okay, and you and you had seen that uh, that citation, so I can certainly um, send that send that along to uh, to this listener. Actually, just a follow-up question from the uh, from the same listener, just. Look for more of your, your great suggestions. Um, do you have any suggestions on maintaining an adequate heart rate on a post mouse during imaging while it's under isofluorine? So that is going to be improved uh, on day two versus day one. That's that's one of the reasons that we've we've decided to move that time point uh, back a little bit. Um, their distinction, I guess, between the intrinsic heart rate and uh, whether or not you're having troubles picking up the ECG signal, right? Um, I, we have found that heart rate does increase slightly after MI, but I, I would suspect that, that what we're really talking about here is having trouble picking up the ECG because the heart rate is uh, pretty regular. It is increased some. Um, one can compensate for that by cooling the mouse down a little bit. <laughs> but that, of course, impacts your cardiac function. So we, we, we're we religious about keeping our, our mice at 37 degrees and documenting that uh, with the 
with the uh, thermo probe. Good. Okay, that's a good good tip. Um, just for the listener here, trying to get a, they're trying to get a sense, I think, of the, the really what is the best measurement method to evaluate heart function and infarct size post MI at multiple time time points, and the question is really about 2D imaging versus 3D imaging, and and what what are your thoughts on that? It seems that this group is using Imaging, um, but they've been hearing more and more about 3D and wondering to get you, wondering about your opinions uh, on the differences. Um, this this could be another uh, one-hour webinar to just to try <laughs> and and do all uh, do this uh, this series of questions uh, justice because um, I'll, I'll address the 2D versus or 3D first to try and try and understand uh, what is meant by that because of course we we do not have true 3D transducers for mice although those are, are available clinically for larger animals and it is pretty convenient to have a 3D uh, phase array transducer uh, for generating LV volumes but uh, even even those centers that have them tend to use uh, D because uh, the 2D slices are uh, of higher resolution. You, you give up a little bit in, in acquiring those volumetric slabs all at a single time. So uh, I think that right what the what the question refers to is um, is can you simplify or can you um, expedite your studies by undersampling either in the long axis or in in your short axis stack. Is there a minimum number of of image planes that you can interrogate and still get the essentially the same data? And that becomes a question of re one cost of image acquisition versus image processing. And again, this can this can vary between laboratories. For instance, um, in in some centers, it might cost $120 an hour to access uh, uh, Vivo 2100. Uh, there might be hourly rate. You might you might have to get your you you meant to do your imaging studies as quickly as possible. But I might point out that with the motorized stage and and with with the right programming, one could actually um, get a a a 0.5 millimeter incremental stack at at, at essentially in the same period of time that you would spend uh, getting a, a conventional B mode. Um, further uh, stack B mode images. Um, so our work is, is always, our analysis is always 3D in the sense that we are taking the summation of stacks. Uh, and the question really uh, boils down to how many uh, acquisitions are you going to take and uh, how much time can you invest in the image processing and and those those can depend on on variables that that are different between centers okay, yeah I, and you know I just actually just on that point we want to go to another question because I think it ties in um, really just about um, how the measurements were done uh, with system versus which what you had done and, and uh, the question is really about about the real strain calculations, when they're, whether they're included with the Vivo strain software or whether, whether they were in-house. So just to make that clarification, for the dimensional image, you see that that's, is done with the Vivo strain um, software. However, the, the reconstruction of those three data sets was done uh, with the group uh, at UVA by basically taking the, those those values um, and then using an, in, an in-house program to show that. So am I correct in how I summarize that, Dr. French? Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for making that distinction. So I showed earlier on, uh, let's see if I can can uh, 
zip back to it here, uh, the some of the output from uh, Vivo strain. So this is this is all Vivo strain, um, and and of course these these very impressive uh, graphs are are all direct outputs of Vivo strain. But what you can also get out of Vivo strain are Excel files that that give you um, each of the values. Displacement values, strain values in each of the 36 segments, and with those uh, Excel files, we input those into MATLAB programs. And so, uh, some of these other um, analyses, particularly with regard to cardiac dyssynchrony, for instance, the contraction index, the dyssynchrony index, uh, those. Are are derived by by taking those Excel raw data from Vivo Strain and inputting them into MATLAB routines, and and we're you know working towards making those available to to the wider public. Um, I think the first thing that we try and make available are are the conventional measures, such as uh, the temporal universe uniformity of strain and standard deviation of time to peak strain so that, that people using uh, both strain could run these MATLAB programs and and get these uh, these metrics directly from their data. Okay. Yeah, I would say anyone has more questions over the, on the specifics of the, the software package that we offer and the data that it outputs, um, you can certainly email us. Uh, info at Visual um, I think we're going to put my personal email up as well, which is angels at visualsonics.com. Just and I might add that uh, if there is interest in that, uh, people should should go ahead and let you know about it because yeah. uh, how are we going to know otherwise? Yeah, exactly. That would be great feedback. Uh, just um, another question here about infarct size, the actual infarct size itself, and whether you looked at that with TTC uh, and also with MRI and ultrasound. So in, in various studies, uh, we haven't have yet uh, performed the ultimate study. Um, so previously uh, in circulation, we validated uh, the, the MRI technique against TTC. And in this study, we we used the MRI as the gold standard. Um, that's um, I guess defensible in the sense that um, that the late gadolinium enhancement is is now you know considered at least at the clinical level the the uh, gold standard with regard to NFARC sizing. So um, in separate validations, yes, we have. Have, we've confirmed it with TTC. It would have been preferable to have done the TTC in this study as well. Uh, I don't have that data to share with you today, but since we previously validated it, we have every reason to believe that it's true. I guess a, in in follow-up to that question, I might, I might add that this radial strain. <laughs> At 6% this cutoff determined in this study is good for our mice at this age under these conditions. And if you were to really do this rigorously at your own institution, what you'd probably want to do is repeat the radial strain measurements, utilize the mice, perform the TTC analysis, and get your own RC analysis because you might find that in your hands the strain threshold is is 14% or 18%. But it's it's a the overall experimental approach is is valid. Okay. And I think just for a few questions, there's some questions more on the the methods that you use. Um, some of the listeners are just wondering how long the to do these types of experiments uh, with some of the strain data that you showed. How long is that scan? How long is the animal under anesthetic for? So we typically uh, conclude these these studies, perform them 
uh, from knocking the mouse down to to uh, to you know putting them in the cage in in 40 minutes. We get a little uncomfortable leaving mice under uh, for more than an hour, especially after MI. Uh, these these are are not um, under the uh, you know the acquisitions don't really take that that long. I might add that um, although the uh, motor stage uh, is is more convenient, you also have a uh, 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 the stage upon which the mouse sits has a micrometer. Uh, built into it, and one, if one aligns the mouse properly on that stage, you can use that micrometer to advance the stage in half millimeter increments, and you can achieve the same uh, the same short axis stack, just the same as you would in MRI. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have a question on the transducers. The, um, someone wondering specifically about the two different types of transducers that uh, Visual Sonics offers, the MS-400 and the MS-550. I actually apologize, I can't remember on your slide what if it said which transducer you were using. Right, we've got the 400. Okay, so um, I guess the question is, you know, certainly the 400 is uh, has a deeper penetration than the 550, which would have superior resolution. Um, was there any particular reason why the choice of transducer? Um. It was my impression that the the 400 was the preferred cardiac transducer. I I think that we do have a 500. I don't know that we yeah. performed a rigorous side by side analysis, but I think that um, I think that our our ability to see the posterior wall was was not adequate yeah. with with the 500. I think it it certainly depends on the model as well. Um, you know, certain some of these uh, MI models that can be more challenging, and the 400 definitely um, just give better the better image quality that you need. It's for, certainly as you go uh, deeper, as you say, on the posterior wall. Um, 550 can be used as well, and we've seen groups do that. So I, I, I guess there's there's no clear cut answer to this based on our experience. It really does um, depend a lot on the model that you're looking at. And I guess it's just it's interesting to hear that for your particular case, the 400 is working well, so that's good information. Uh, I've got one last question here. I think we've, we've got almost all of them. If we, if we haven't, I do apologize ahead of time. We'll, we'll do a check at the end. If there's any we've missed, we'll, we'll certainly try to get that answered uh, with, with Dr. French's help. Um, i am just read this one here as it comes in. Will the ejection fraction percent measurement uh, better be done better on a parasternal long axis B mode or Parasternal short axis M mode. Um, this, this particular listener is finding this variation. I uh, wonder if you have any experience, Dr. French, with this, these two types of measurements. So we we rarely use the M mode because we prefer to to have that um, to to be able to assemble a a three D um, reconstruction of the heart. Um, our, our concern with M mode is that uh, it's it's undersampling to <laughs> to a very great extent, and and so uh, it will be entirely dependent upon what what line you're querying, whether you're inside an infarct or outside the infarct, and without knowing where you are relative to the infarct, uh, you you could be deceiving yourself. Right. Okay. I think uh, on that note, um, as I mentioned. I hope we've got most of the questions. I, I, I don't think we've gone to all of them, but uh, Dr. Frank, I know you're going to have to run soon to get to a lecture, so I'm, I, won't, I don't want to keep it too much longer. Um, and I'd also like to try to keep, keep within the, the time frame that we had uh, set aside for people, because I know everyone's got uh, busy schedules and, and, uh, and busy days. So um, I would like to thank you on behalf of the audience and everyone here at Visual Sonics, Dr. French, for joining us today. Uh, it was an excellent talk. Uh, some great questions from the audience. Uh, it's always interesting to hear um, the types of uh, issues, challenges, questions, and queries that people have. Um, so thanks for sending those in, and we will uh, respond and follow up with any that we weren't able to get to. Uh, just a couple of reminders before we sign off. Um, 
I did, a, again, there's a recording going to be made available uh, of today's session, so you will have that. Um, you can sit and, and look at it uh, at your own time if there's anything you'd like to review. There will be a survey included in this email that we'll send out. If you do have some time, we'd love to hear your feedback on, the, on this session, any feedback about future sessions or uh, the Visual Sonics products in general. Um, and one last reminder about AHA. We will be hosting a customer event at AHA. We'll also be at booth number 301. So please visit our website uh, for information on the customer event. This is an event with dinner. We will also be joined, uh, coincidentally, by Dr. French, who will be presenting, along with uh, Dr. Wolfram Zimmerman uh, from Germany. We'll have some uh, interesting scientific sessions and the opportunity to, to speak with uh, our speakers and other members of Visual Sonic staff and other, uh, other attendees that are present. So please register for the event, uh, this dinner event uh, at the conference. Last reminder is the future webinars that will be coming up. We have in December a session with one of our application specialists scheduled to talk about microbubble contrast imaging. So please join us for that. Uh, and please check the website regularly for upcoming web sessions in the new year. So again, thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you to Dr. French. Uh, it was great to have you on the line today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Speak with everyone soon uh, and enjoy the rest.